about to put herself into cryo sleep. <laughs> so yeah, she's taken off her clothes. Heaven forbid a woman just gets comfy in the privacy of her own escape pod. <laughs> like, <laughs> what is the problem? You know what I did have a problem with in this scene? When she takes her necklace off and flings it on the floor, I'm like, that was the only unrealistic thing. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Art of Costume Blogcast. I'm Elizabeth Joy Glass. And I'm Captain Spencer Williams. Oh, hello, Spencer. How was your spring break? (laughs) It was so fun. It was nice to just, you know, have some time off, I guess. You know, didn't do anything too crazy. Definitely didn't go to Disney World. So No, I did and it was amazing. It was incredible. (laughs) Wait, so did you go to to like Animal Kingdom or just like... No, we just went to Hollywood Studios because honestly, all of us were kind of like, we just want to sit by the pool and like (laughs) not do anything. Yes. But I, we did want to go one day and I wanted to go to see all like the new Star Wars stuff. So we went to Hollywood Studios. Oh, fun. So that was fun. Isn't Um, it so crazy that like experience? It's just like literally you feel like you're in a whole different world. It's insane. Literally. Um, Some of the cast members are a little too dedicated to the bit. I will (laughs) say. (laughs) Yeah, but when they're like acting like they don't know what a photograph is. (laughs) I'm like, come on, man. (laughs) Hey, help me out here. (laughs) Like, oh, I'm sorry. A hologram or whatever they... (laughs) <laughs> they called it something weird. I was like, okay, just take the picture. Uh, did I ever tell you about when, well, I know I told you when me, Daniel and Chloe went to, to Disneyland and we went I on the, the aftermath of that. Well, yeah, <laughs> we were exhausted. We went on, I think it's called rise of the resistance to like really like yes. experiential ride. And one of the stormtroopers straight yelled at Chloe and, and me and Daniel got so scared. We like act like we didn't know who Chloe was. <laughs> oh my gosh. So my parents had gone in it like t- a year or two ago, closer to when it first opened. And they were like, I thought it was great. I thought everyone on the ride was like playing their parts really well. But they said like they weren't as like into the roles as they were previously <laughs> mm. they were like yeah they were a lot nicer this time <laughs> uh, the stormtroopers are like it's spring break bro like <laughs> let's come on <laughs> yeah no that was crazy i wasn't i wasn't expecting that i was not expecting that and then do they have smugglers run um is that the one where you drive the millennium falcon yeah the one where i was somehow put in charge of flying the ship and i crashed it multiple times into the ground sounds about right sounds about right yeah i i (laughs) wasn't expecting that to be so much fun so uh, it was a good time um well i didn't go to disney world but i definitely stayed back i'm currently watching bridgerton which is a lot of fun worked on the blog you know um doing some website stuff but just you know kind of taking some time to just playing a little bit of video games which i don't really get to do as much anymore um, you know, watching some good movies. So I'm just excited to be back though, but it was, it was a nice little break. Yes, it was. It was, but, um, we are back and we are back with one of your favorites, Spencer. Yeah. Speaking of you traveling to the outer rim, I'm very excited to say that with this episode starts the beginning of our space month. I am so excited. I'm so excited. <laughs> I've never seen alien before this was my first time oh my gosh and i loved it so much more than i thought i would Uh, oh my gosh okay let's get to alien just so everyone knows today we're watching alien today actually is april 26 which is the national alien day so it's the day every year where the studios kind of put out a whole bunch of aliens content I'm sure by the time you've listened to this, I'm going to guess that they put out the trailer for the new Alien TV show. I'm pretty sure. TV show? Yeah, they're coming off a TV show now. What? I know. It's going to be awesome. I believe it's going to be on FX. But yeah, it's 426 because the planet they land on is LV426, which is why this whole thing happened. When we were planning our first episode for Space Month, 
it happened to land on April 26th. And I was like, hey, I know what we're watching. (laughs) I know. You were like, hold everything. This is what we're watching. I was like, okay. (laughs) (laughs) I'm a big alien nerd and I'm just so excited. I can't believe you've never seen this before. That's insane. Like I said, the only other alien movie I've seen is Covenant. And that's because we went to go see it. I think for your birthday or maybe just you were like, let's go go see Covenant, something like that. It it could be either or both of them sound right. Um, Yeah, I love Alien Covenant, but to me, nothing compares to the first two Alien films. Um, The second one, the sequel is actually really great also. So you should see that. Yeah, so different. So different from Covenant. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I'm like, dang, Ridley is such a badass. Like... I already love Sigourney Weaver. This was incredible. This was like everything. This was everything. I think we should just get into it. There's so much to talk about. Let's let's get into it. And Spencer, what what's this week's episode gonna be like? (laughs) Well, if you all remember, Elizabeth is a registered Dracula ologist. When we did Bram Stoker's Dracula, that was her thing. Really went ham on the research. For me, I am consider myself quite the expert on everything alien. Alienologist. <laughs> Alienologist. So this week, Elizabeth will be reading the summary and I will be taking you behind the wardrobe. It feels weird saying that. Are you ready, Spencer? I don't know that I am ready. No. But I'm ready. Part of being ready is being the person who controls the slides. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> it's so hard. Okay, let's get into it. Elizabeth, why don't you read us our summary? Our summary this week for Alien. When the crew of the Nostromo is awakened from their cryo sleep to investigate a distress call of unknown origins, the investigation leads them to encounter an alien organism that leaps out and attaches itself to one of the crew, throwing the rest of the crew into chaos. That's a good way to summarize it. If you have not seen (laughs) Alien... In the years since 1979, I don't know what to tell you. There are spoilers. Yeah. Come on now. All right. Well, I'm so excited to bring you behind the wardrobe. Let's get into it. I will say that there are a lot of people that were a part of the 1979 version of Alien. Um, so try not to get lost in all of it. I kind of do sometimes, but I'm here to hold your hand. Um, as you all know, Alien was directed by Ridley Scott. And costume designer was actually John Molo. But back then, costume design and visual effects really never just depended on one person. This film was a huge group project. Um, The costume designer who created the Xenomorph was actually H.R. Geiger, who is an incredible artist who I'm really excited to talk about. Yes. Um, John Molo's notable work would be Star Wars A New Hope, which he won his first Oscar, his first film, first Oscar, Um, Then he came back for Empire Strikes Back. He did a film called Gandhi, which he won his second Oscar. And then he also did a film called Chaplin, which he did with the legendary costume designer, Ellen Mirajnik, who Elizabeth would know from the first season of Bridgerton. So, yeah, amongst a hundred other things. (laughs) Is that the Chaplin with Robert Downey Jr. playing Charlie Chaplin? Sure. Okay. (laughs) I don't know. <laughs> okay, Spencer. I believe it is. Actually, yes, it is. That that would be the one. Um, never seen it, but I've always wanted to. It I've looks never awesome. seen it either. I've seen a bunch of clips, though, from it. Right. So let's dive into this crazy story. Um, so John Malo's father was Eugene Malo, and he loved to collect tin soldiers and military insignia. So much so, John really became quite professional on this subject. His passion for military uniform led to his experience serving as a realism advisor on the sets of films such as Charge of the Light Brigade in 1966, Nicholas and Alexandra in 71, and on Stanley Kubrick's Barry Lyndon. So he's never so much a costume designer, really just a um, realism advisor. He was the best of the best when it came to military uniforms, which you and I have talked about a lot, military uniforms, costumes, It's incredibly complex. They're insane. Yeah, I could not even imagine. One day, John was contacted by this young filmmaker that was pretty new. No one really knew about. His name was George Lucas. Um, You know, I don't know if you've heard of him. 
Uh, I don't know. Sounds like a little guy. <laughs> don't really know. Uh, George Lucas approached John Mollo to work on this crazy new film called Star Wars A New Hope. And John was basically like, um, I'm not a costume designer. And George Lucas was like, yeah, but your expertise, like, this is perfect for it. So John eventually said, yes, yeah, sure, let's give it a shot. Which John eventually did win an Oscar for, which was crazy when you think about it. Yeah. Uh, Malo was quoted saying once that, talking about Star Wars, um, it was sort of a space western, and one of the heroes was a dustbin, <laughs> which I think is <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> um, he really went to this film with no experience as a designer, but as a master of reference. For example, which we will be talking about later on, um, he intentionally designed the uniforms of the Imperial officers in Star Wars to represent German Nazi u officer uniforms. Um, so he really kind of saw like where his expertise kind of came through. Fast forward to a couple years later, after seeing Star Wars, everyone was obsessed with sci-fi. Everyone was ready to just jump on this. Who's trying to create the next Star Wars? Then enters Ridley Scott, the incredible Ridley Scott, who I love so dearly. Though he's had some controversial takes lately, I will say. Um, Ridley Scott felt compelled to make his own science fiction feature of his own. And he began to work out on this story called Tristan and the Soul. And when sketching out his storyboards, he really drew inspiration from the comic book artists who had inspired him the most, Jean Mobius Gerard. Um, Mobius, the artist, was recently working on a film called Dune, which eventually fell through. I don't know if you ever heard of that film. Um, we all know Dune had a hard time taking off <laughs> <laughs> until about 2021. <laughs> um, on this film, Gerard met fellow artists and future alien alumni Chris Foss, H.R. Geiger, and Dan O'Bannon, who was a screenwriter. When Dune eventually fell apart... O'Bannon was devastated and dusted off a script called Star Beast, which would eventually become Alien. Really, Scott got attached to the project. He loved it. And the rest kind of was history, kind of. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, costume design was a little bit different. So many people had their hand in costume design, especially a lot of the artists. Um, comic book artists really were kind of driving what the costume design of this film looked like. It wasn't just a costume designer walking on set and like, these are my sketches. In this film, they basically gave the designer the sketches. They're like, this is kind of what we're doing, <laughs> which is so different. Um, there's this lovely quote from Dan O'Bannon about uh, Jean Gerard Mobius, kind of talking about how his role played into the costume design of this film, who was the artist. Um, Dan O'Bannon said, Mobius thought that they were paying him $5,000 a week, when in fact, they were only paying him $500 a week. Therefore, he couldn't afford to work on the film on that basis at this time because of his expenses. So he gave them the spacesuit designs, got on a plane, and went back to France. So his designs basically went on to lend to Alien, but they basically just gave him a check and said, thank you for your contributions. <laughs> <laughs> wow, way to pull one over on somebody. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, wow, this sounds very typical. Um, that quote actually came from a website called Alien Series. The article is called Dressing the Future, and I'll be referencing them quite a couple of times. Back to John Mallow. He was fresh off of Star Wars, and he was basically tasked to bring John Gerard's designs to life. Um, but the costume design did not end with Mobius. Once John Mallow came onto set, he really wanted to bring all of his military experience back into the picture. So as we really talk about this film, you're really going to see his hand on all of the uniforms worn by the crew of the Nostromo. You're going to see tons of patches, um, lots of like utility uniforms. This really was his specialty. And right after Star Wars, he was really feeling it. And I'm just so excited to talk about it because there's lots of great stuff in this film. I can't wait. How exciting. Yes, I was so excited. So let's take a little break. And when we come back, we're going to dive right into Alien. Yes. Hi, this is Dan, audio engineer of the blogcast. Just wanted to let you know that if you'd like to support the show, 
You can become a patron at patreon.com slash the art of costume. There we post unheard bloopers, highlights, and bonus episodes just for our patrons. Make sure to check out the description for all of our links. And thank you for all of your support. Spencer, doesn't a cryo sleep sound nice? Yes, actually, if there was anything from a futuristic film that I want in real life, it's cryo sleep. This, they look so cozy. They look so at peace. I'm like, ooh, just put me, <laughs> stop my aging, put me in a little bottle and wake me up when the traveling's done. Uh, it looks so comfy. I love the white little shorts. It sounds so lovely. Um, yeah, no, when we first get to the sleeping pod scene, everyone's just kind of resting comfortably. But what I love about these beginning scenes is you really just get a look at the sets of this film. Mm-hmm. It's really incredible. Also really claustrophobic, which was really yeah. one of the attentions too. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I wasn't expecting that those first couple minutes where the, it, the camera's just like wandering around. I was waiting for something to pop out and it just never did. <laughs> no, it's almost like the the sets are like kind of as haunting as like the actual horror of the film. Yeah. Um. So let's talk about the crew. Uh, we have a lot of great characters to talk about. And the first thing I always kind of notice is just how great all the uniforms are for each of the crew members. Um, and there's a lot of great world building in these costumes that you probably wouldn't even see the first time you're watching it. For example, they all work for a company called Waylon Yutani. And you would only know that by the actual badges that they're wearing. And it's stamped on everything. But they never say the words. And actually, the words aren't even mentioned until the third Alien film. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So that's how much like world building the costume designer and really Scott were doing from the very beginning. They had no idea it was going to blow up. But just thinking of the feat that they created. So John Malo talked about Waylon Yutani saying that that was a... Um, that was Ron Cobb's idea. Um, John Mello said, Waylon Yutani was Ron's invention, and we all liked the sound of it. The name and the Egyptian wings, which are seen on one of the logo patches, were hotly pursued at the beginning, but we eventually dropped the words, and we just used the wings as a logo. So I don't think we've ever done a film where we focus so much on patches. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I'll try not to stay there too long. No, I loved those patches because I was like, ooh, they look like they look like military, but they're not. Right. Uh, There's like so much satire too behind all the patches and the military uniforms. Ron Cobb, one of the artists on the films who, once again, it's an artist who's like really influencing the costume designs. He said, one of the things I enjoyed most about Alien was its subtle satirical content, explained Cobb. Um, science fiction films offer golden opportunities to throw in little scraps of information that suggest enormous changes in the world. There's a certain potency in these kinds of remarks. Waylon Yutani, for instance, is almost a joke, but not quite. I want to imply that poor old England is back on its feet and has united with the Japanese who have taken over the building of spaceships the same, same way they have now with cars and super tankers. So I just thought that was hilarious because to us, it's just a patch. But all the nerds behind the scenes are like, this is hilarious. Yeah. Oh, I love that. (laughs) Um, I'm showing Elizabeth at the moment. We have pictures of a lot of John Malo's uh, sketches, actually. He just like drew all over his scripts with just pictures of uniforms, patches, and brought them all to life. I love the sketch of the, the shirt takes me back to my tech sketching days. Oh my gosh, right. <laughs> I didn't think about that. <laughs> um, last quote for a little bit. Um, John Mello said about Ridley Scott, really is a great stickler for detail. So we had a rubber Waylon Yutani stamp made and went about madly labeling everything. Also because Ridley want everything to look well worn and lived in. We washed, scraped, and even sandpapered the costumes many times before they were even worn, which I think is hilarious because he's so new to costume designing and he's de-stressing aging costumes. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I love because they do look well worn. They're like very lived in. 
Right, which I thought was hilarious that they came out of, like, cryo sleep and then they put on, like, these dirty costumes. I'm like, why was Ash not washing their clothes while they were working? Right? <laughs> Sleeping. So let's dive into all of our characters, Elizabeth. Yeah, we got Captain Dallas, who I was like, why are you so useless? <laughs> like, <laughs> he literally doesn't do anything helpful. No. Ever. I, I'd venture to say most of these characters aren't very helpful in the end. That's true. Um, Captain Dallas was played by Tom Skerritt. Um, very 70s. Very 70s. Though we're in the late 70s, he just screams 70s. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Those chucks, the the jacket, the beard. <laughs> it's hilarious. But of course, he's wearing his patch on the jacket, which I thought was really cool. Um, My favorite, personal favorite, was the navigator, Lambert. She was just like so over all of it. And she just... <laughs> She looked so laid back. I love just like her her vest with the t-shirt with her patch on it. Yeah, it was so great. I love the use of the color too in her costume. Um, it's such a very 70s color palette. Um, but yeah, I love that the costume designer like created all of the same uniforms, but just different variations. Like hers yeah. is a vest compared to a jacket. Yeah, I agree. It all It all looks like it came from the same place just being used in different ways what i didn't realize till my 200th watch of this film was that executive officer kane was played by the incredible john hurt you didn't know that i, I just never put two and two together i was like oh my gosh that's olivander from I'd harry never potter <laughs> i'd never seen it and i knew that was him <laughs> <laughs> just never clicked uh, he was a great guy he was a great guy and on the film he should have been playing with the eggs. <laughs> That's Rick, the whole reason they got into that mess. Rookie should mistake. just let them be. <laughs> um, I do love his costume, though, because it does kind of give like an officer vibe to it. You know, it's not very dirty. It's very, I, I don't want to say formal, but compared to everyone else, there is a little bit of a sophistication to his costume. Yeah, it's clean. It's profes- more professional than the rest of them. Right. Um. Same goes for Ash, played by the amazing Ian, Ian Holm. <laughs> Again, very professional, yeah. but we all know why that is. <laughs> I loved his costume. Um, first, because it's using like a baby blue character, which as a costume design person that all automatically sets off like a red flag in my head. Like something is kind of off with this guy, <laughs> which we come to find out he's a robot. Yeah. Who wanted... John Hurt to get an alien burst through his chest. Yeah, he's very fascinated by the whole process. He's really having a good time. He is. He was creepy, especially when they reanimated his head yeah. to get some information. I was like, ew. <laughs> that part was gross. That part makes me nauseous. <laughs> um, I love Ian Holm. I miss him. Such a great actor. The engineers, Parker and Brett, talk about two laid back guys who just want to make that money. (laughs) Uh, The engineers, their costumes are hilarious to me because they are not wearing a military thing at all. Kind of. Engineer Brett, who's wearing a Hawaiian shirt with like a jacket thrown over. He has like a patch or a stamp like on his jacket and on his hat. But he's really just pretty laid back and just wants to have some beers and fix things. He doesn't really care about this whole thing. No, he does not at all. Unlike Parker, who's like, I'm just here for the money. Is money involved? Yes. Okay. (laughs) Uh, He's wearing like, I think it's a leather jacket. Um, Yeah. It's like a leather bomber jacket. Yeah. A leather bomber jacket with the blue headband, which is such like an iconic look. Um, for such like a character that's really not that big of a deal to the story but like all the costumes because there's only so many characters are all kind of iconic to me definitely i knew the look of most of them without ever having seen it because you just if you're interested in film at all you're gonna see these right And then we have the incomparable, the incredible, one of my absolute heroes, Sigourney Weaver, who played Ripley. Um, uh, There's so much to say about Ripley. 
The only one with any sense. The only one with any sense, which probably if they had l- <laughs> goes for if they life. If they listened to her, they wouldn't have gotten themselves into so much trouble. Right. I love how when they were trying to bring basically the alien back to the ship, Ripley was like, you are not coming back on this ship. Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can keep your dirty self outside. She's like, why do you want to bring that in here? Absolutely not. <laughs> Um, I love Ripley because to me, she's just like one of, you know, the ultimate feminist icons. Um, She really, for Ripley to be such like a leading character was really pretty serious for 1979. Yeah. Um, Really, Scott, literally just a couple weeks ago, did an interview in LA Times and he kind of talked about this. Um, Really, Scott said, I think the idea actually came from Alan Ladd Jr., um, who was at the time president of 20th Century Fox. Um, Alan basically asked, why can't Ripley be a woman? And there was a long pause and everyone was kind of like, "Mm, yeah, (laughs) that is crazy. (laughs) Um, And really, Scott himself said, I never thought about that. Um, Why not? It's a fresh direction. That's why I thought about that. And away we went. So really, Scott then also mentioned that he found Sigourney by word of mouth. Somebody had mentioned that Sigourney was on an off-Broadway stage doing something that I should meet her. And I did. And there it was. She was perfect in terms of scale, size, intelligence. Her acting is just fantastic. And so it was made for her, really. Um, yeah, which I, it's such a crazy concept that back in 79, people are like, a female lead? What? That's, that's so crazy. People still find that kind of crazy. Yeah, it's pathetic. So then, of course, I can't move on without some quotes from Ripley herself, Sigourney Weaver. On Bustle.com, Sigourney Weaver said, I got my first professional job at the public theater when I was just 27. At that point, I was suddenly offered a lead in a TV comedy. But for me, comedy had been king, especially television comedy. But I turned down that job. I did a whole screen test where I did a run through of the character in the movie. Really Scott had me do about seven scenes and he built a whole set to have me do it. At the same time, I was trying not to get my hopes up because my chances of getting this role was very slim. There were people who were big names apparently who wanted this part, but the writers maybe really insisted that had to be someone who was unknown because they didn't want anyone to think this person was going to survive the film. What they hoped was the audience would think John Hurt's character was going to be the hero And when he died, it's a tremendous rug being pulled out from under you. But no one would ever think this girl, so green behind the ears, would suddenly be the survivor and come out of it. So it's kind of a feminist ending. That's what works best for the story, to cast an unknown. Yes. This was her first role. She was 27 years old. That's crazy. It's insane every time I think about it. It's crazy, but I love her uniform very professional. I love the like the navyish blue with her with her patches and also very simple cuz she's like I'm just here to get my job done and that's about it. Yeah, it's it's very like non-binary in a sense that's just it's just a utility suit. She's just here to get her work done. She's a warrant officer, so she's just kind of taking care of the ship and having to, you know, take care of loose ends. So it's just a a very suitable suit (laughs) also i thought you would love this film because she focuses the orange cat she focuses so heavily on the cat (laughs) (laughs) that would be me i'd be like come here kitty we gotta get you safe (laughs) the part at the end of the film there's like a solid five minutes where she's just trying to save the cat i so my original plan today was to like watch half of this then watch spider-man <laughs> and then finish this before we started recording and um when i couldn't when you weren't awake to approve the the link for me to watch it <laughs> i was like uh, i guess i'll keep watching it and then like stop whenever he responds but then i was watching it and got to the part where the cat was missing and i was like i gotta know if this cat survives <laughs> <laughs> it actually looks like one of your cats honestly uh, it looks like Arwen. It looks like Arwen. That's so cute. So now that we have the cast got together, it's time for us to go investigate some crashed alien spaceships. 
And I love the spacesuits that all the crew are wearing. They're so interesting. Yes, I love them as well. Um, it kind of gave me Fifth Element vibes. But I'm going to guess Fifth Element probably borrowed from this yeah. <laughs> a little bit. Just, especially like the top with how like bulky it is. I loved it though. Yeah, it's really interesting. In an article dressing the future alien series, it was said that Really had already planned on a Japanese aesthetic for Tristan and his sold. And Really Scott was really inspired by Japanese armor, which was basically translated into these spacesuits for the crew. I love that. Now that you say that, it definitely has like a samurai armor look to it. That's so interesting. Especially the shoulder pieces. Like those are big and like scream samurai to me. The sh the shoulders and like what are they, the greaves on the on their legs. Very, very. I can see the influence there. Yeah, though I do love like the leg greaves that look like just like mattress pads that are just like duct taped <laughs> to their legs. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit yeah it was 1979 um so yeah we get to the scenes where the crew is just kind of walking around this crashed alien ship and it's pretty spooky it's very spooky um i was not comfortable with all the eggs <laughs> and when john hurt was like "Ooh, let's go look at these i was like why this isn't what you're here for what are you doing leave them be yeah, it's very creepy. And you really see H.R. Geiger's um, influence on the film at this point, especially with like yeah. the space jockey who, you know, is kind of zombified at this point. Just like the architecture is just like really incredible. And, you know, it's they didn't realize that the world building they were doing at this point, because in Alien Covenant, we basically see these same sets all these years later. Oh, yeah. I was about to say, I love that they kept the same aesthetic. And it's it's a time it's timeless, really. It looks incredible. It really is. It's very spooky. So as we mentioned earlier, the eggs hatch, things start to go south and they bring back executive officer Kane back on the ship after he was surprised if a little face hugger who attached to his head, which was very gross. It still spooks me out every time. <laughs> I hate that. I hate that. But I do love their <laughs> uniforms when they're back on the ship because when they get to the planet, they all kind of like dress a little bit more similarly. I don't know if that's because they're like, OK, we got a job to do, but they have the, those great military type uh, button downs on. And I just love how it makes them look like a crew working together. Yeah, they are all very similar at this point. They're all wearing like this olive green shirt underneath with like white on mm -hmm. top of it so 70s <laughs> and i love that they changed into white because of our next scenes yeah i don't know if it was intentional but it definitely worked in the favor um when executive officer kane has quite the terrible dinner i should say uh yeah when that little chest burster pops its head out and murders him yeah, this seems insane. So since you've never seen Alien, I'll just give you some behind the scenes on this. It has been rumored for years that the cast did not know how this scene was going to play out because they only did it one time. So they all knew that something crazy was going to happen, but they didn't realize how bloody and horrifying it would be. So the Reactions that you see, especially in Veronica Cartwright's character, those are real reactions because they just saw an alien hatch out this guy's chest, blood sprayed everywhere. It's insane. And uh, Ridley Scott recently said, once I blew blood all over that set, there was no cleaning it up. Um, so John Hurt knelt so that only his head was visible above a hole in a table and a false torso was placed to meet his neck. I kept it very much from the actors, and I kept the actual little creature, whatever that would be, from the actors. I never wanted them to see it. Remember, there was no digital effects in those days at all. I'm going to somehow bring that creature out of his chest. And it's just one of the craziest horror scenes of all time. It is. I've also heard a lot about how like people were terrified of this movie. 
And it's like, it's so funny because like by today's standards, like this is kind of mild. Yeah. <laughs> like it's still a great like horror film. But even that scene where it's like, oh, there's so much blood. I'm like, I've watched Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> That's so crazy. And like I have a picture up for Elizabeth too of like an audience reaction from 1979 where. I'm that woman right in the front. I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't imagine that this film came out like this. It's crazy. But back to the costumes, I love that they're all wearing white because it works perfectly with the fountain of blood that covers the room. Yeah, no, it it works perfectly. I love how they're all shocked. Like, that's great. I'm like, I don't think you could have gotten that any other way than keeping it secret from them. (laughs) My gosh, can you imagine like being on that set and they did it in one take and they were like, all right, everyone hit the showers. Go home. (laughs) Great job today. (laughs) Like what? Costume department's like, we're just going to take these. Yeah, costume department. <laughs> these aren't being washed. Or <laughs> costume department. In parentheses. <laughs> air quotes. <laughs> uh, well, uh, that was some bloody fun. Let's take a little break. It was some bloody fun. We're going to have to get an explicit rating in England. <laughs> yeah. When we get back, we'll dive into the xenomorph. I can't wait. Hi, this is Dan, audio engineer of the Blogcast, here to let you know that if you wanted to support the show, you can head over to theartofcostume.com slash podstore. There you can buy some awesome Tee Public merch with the Blogcast logo. We have shirts, sweaters, coffee mugs, stickers, and of course, a baby onesie. Thank you for all of your support. Are you ready to talk about some xenomorphs? I was born ready to talk about the xenomorphs. <laughs> I know you are. I know you are. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, the costume designer was John Malo, but the xenomorph really was designed by H.R. Geiger. Geiger was a Swiss artist who helped bring this terror to life, leading Alien to winning an Academy Award for visual effects, which very duly deserved. Yes. Uh, there was an article in Den of Geek that explained that it was O'Bannon who first placed a 1977 book of Geiger's paintings, Necromnicon, into the hands of a newly appointed director, Ridley Scott. O'Bannon and Scott did not see eye to eye on all matters, but they immediately agreed on one thing. The erotic, deadly looking creature in a painting entitled Necronom 4 was their alien so they basically got this book. What? They opened it up and they were like, oh, well, there's the alien. <laughs> so, That's wild. I always thought Ridley Scott came up with that. No, he just saw this artist and I was like, wow, that that's pretty nice. I would die to get this book. It is very expensive. It feels like when we were talking about that Dracula book back in the day. What? Um, but it's very erotic, too. Like, he really designed his <laughs> aliens to be, like, very sexual, too, um, which is pretty crazy. It's all crazy. So Geiger was said, saying, I always want my alien to be a beautiful thing, something aesthetic. A monster isn't just something disgusting. It can have a kind of beauty. It can move gracefully. It can be sinuous, which I was like, okay, sir. I I get what you're saying. <laughs> we understand. Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> I get what you're saying. It is beautiful. I wouldn't say graceful. It, I guess it does have a little bit of a swagger when it walks. Uh So because this was before CGI, um, they had to put a person in a xenomorph suit, which was insane. Um, The xenomorph costume was built to house an actor named Balaji Badejo, who was the actor who played the xenomorph. He measured at six feet, 10 inches tall. Whoa. Very tall. Very, very (laughs) tall, which is horrific. Um, Hero Collector gave an excellent accounting of the process in creating the xenomorph costume that I just wanted to read to you, Elizabeth, because I think it's intense. 
It was said that a plaster cast was made of Badejo's body to create a statue of him. But then Geiger sculpted around this statue using all sorts of weird items, including Rolls Royce tubes, snake vertebrae, animal meat, and he used allegedly some pieces of a human skull, which was later found. I was just reading this before you and I came on the air. After the film, they all kind of looked back at the human skull thing, which they got for like, you know, from a medical practice. And I started to think about, they're like, where did they get the skulls? And it turns out it was a little bit of a shady process on the other end. (laughs) But I'm really going to dive into this after you and I are done. The 70s. Yeah, it was a different time. Um, Once they had this sculpture, the final one piece suit was then made from a rubber mold of the statue with accessories. Um, Then the two meter tail was added preventing Badejo from sitting down. So a special swing set was made for him when he needed to take breaks (laughs) on set. (laughs) So I love seeing all these pictures of like the xenomorph just like casually like standing around. That is crazy. Go back. (laughs) (laughs) Because he just couldn't go anywhere. Oh my gosh. That man is beautiful. He's like looks like he could be a model oh my gosh yeah i mean i wouldn't be surprised if he was like that's what's under the xenomorph (laughs) (laughs) that xenomorph is disgusting (laughs) (laughs) so and then a separate alien head was made by by carlo rambaldi a celebrated specialist in a mechanization of artificial creatures which is quite the title um the head has a highly complex apparatus that controlled the extending mouth within a mouth so there was a lot happening in this head. I can't believe they used an actual human skull, and I'm kind of disgusted. <laughs> yeah, it's a little creepy. This is a picture of um, Geiger working on said head. Um, that It does look pretty human, so it is a little creepy. Um, <laughs> I'll turn the picture, which created the xenomorph as we know it, which I love. It's just such a beautiful story because... The xenomorph went on for decades and we're still seeing it. Yeah. Legit thought it was a puppet the whole time I was watching. I was like, wow, that's a really good puppet. (laughs) No, it's just some poor man who probably like really wants to sit down, but he can't. (laughs) Oh my goodness. I love it. I love this. I love seeing it up close. You can see like the leathery, like the suit they had. Oh my goodness. It's crazy, too, because you don't even really see the alien all that much in a film. It's no. really a horror film based on, like, tension and noise. I mean, every jump scare in this film, it basically comes from a cat or, like, steam coming yeah. out of a machine. <laughs> yeah, so. no. Like, it wouldn't... Up close, it would not have worked as well. I mean, that was the same thing with all those. Uh, was it... What's the other one where they barely show the the shark one? Oh, Jaws. Jaws, yeah. (laughs) All those 70s horror. That film with the shark, what's it called? (laughs) Apparently that was like the second to last movie my grandmother ever saw in theaters. (laughs) And she was just like told my mother, like, let me know when all the scary parts are over. And then my mom, she was like, I think the last movie your grandmother saw in theaters was Star Wars. And she walked out. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and she's like i don't think she ever went to another movie i was like oh wow iconic those movies she was like these are all terrible what's going on here <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now that we have our xenomorph we're getting into all this film the story really like starts coming apart real quickly things on the ship go south yeah ash turns out to be a little bit of a robot a robot an evil evil robot yeah, his his um his switch flips very quickly, and it's still disturbing to me even to this day. Like seeing like the dissembled ash on a table, just like spitting out that like milky robot goo. Yeah. It's, yeah, like it. Yeah, it looks like it looks like baby food. It's gross. Um, but I also hate like they rip his head off, and it's like all these wires and like stuff come out of him, which like it's clearly not a human but it like reminds you of like intestines and stuff and it's just very gross it's very gross and it, it reminds me of like when you go to the beach and see like kelp and seaweed all over <laughs> that's what yeah. it always reminded me of 
<laughs> I don't I don't like the feel of seaweed. Yeah, me neither. That's the worst part of the beach, and I love the beach. <laughs> I know. Whenever I feel it, I'm like, I'm dying. <laughs> Something's got me. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they felt in Alien. Yeah, um, clearly, and most of them were right. <laughs> One of my favorite parts, though, is when they're putting the dissembled head of Ash on the table. And then you could tell that, like, the the editing, like, real quickly cuts and it becomes Ian Holmes. Yeah. <laughs> Which is like... I love how they're like, give us some answers, you bitch. What did you do? <laughs> <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Aww. Things go really south. The alien just eventually picks off the crew members one by one. Um, lots of tension. It's just a very, you spend a lot of time just kind of watching these crew members just like do, 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 do. Um, and it eventually ends well for them. Uh, I know. I feel bad for all of them. Cause it's like, they, they know there's nothing they can do, but stand there and watch this thing murder them. <laughs> right. It's, it's really horrific. Um, I suggest everyone watch the director's cut at some point too, because there is a crazy scene with Captain Dallas and you kind of see what happens to him. What? Um, but it really kind of sets the page for the next alien film um, where you kind of, they kind of reuse that to like put in the next film. So you should check it out. So once Ripley realizes that all of her friends are dead, she quickly like changes course. It's all about finding her cat and getting yes. the hell out of here, which I'm just like, this is Elizabeth to a T. <laughs> I am Ripley. <laughs> I was actually watching this and I was like, I wonder how hard that would be to make a Ripley costume. Oh. Until this scene. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Ripley hits the self-destruct button without thinking twice. She's like, we're done. Goodbye. Yeah. Gets in her escape pod and she's out. And she thinks she's safe. She just strips down. <laughs> She thinks she's safe. Uh, Ripley really just strips down, gets into her tank top and little underwear. And this scene actually is like pretty controversial with alien fans. But to me, it's not controversial at all. No. A lot of fans feel like, which this is one of my pet peeves. um, We're having another uh, Lola bunny from (sighs) Space Jam moment. (laughs) Okay, give it to me, Spencer. A lot of people felt that they were sexualizing Sigourney Weaver's character at this moment. But to me, she just spent the past probably day or so running from an alien and watching her friends get massacred. Of course, she stripped off her clothes. She's a human. Like, it makes no sense to me. Yeah. And it's just like people sexualizing a woman's body. They're not allowed to, like, wear a tank top and underwear. Like, that automatically makes it sexual as compared to, like, the first shot of this film is, like, every single All male crew member yes. in, like, the tidy whities <laughs> Oh my gosh. I can't believe people were I can't believe people were upset about this. To this day, people still bring it up. And I just want to like bang my head into a wall. I hate it because it it makes sense. When you see them all in the their cryo sleep things, they're not wearing they're hardly wearing any clothes. She's about to put herself into cryo sleep. <laughs> so yeah, she's taken off her clothes. Heaven forbid a woman just get comfy in the privacy of her own escape pod. <laughs> like, <laughs> what is the problem? Uh, you know what I did have a problem with in this scene? When she takes her necklace off and flings it on the floor. I'm like, that was the only unrealistic thing <laughs> that happened in that moment. No woman just flings their necklace onto the floor. And they put it on the side table <laughs> or their vanity. Her being in her underwear and tank top is normal. I have expected her to take her shirt off, honestly. <laughs> honestly, which that would have made sense even if she did. Um, yeah. Like, yeah, she pulls her onward down a little bit by accident because she's getting unchanged because she just yeah. watched her ship blow up. Like, she's kind of a little bit frazzled at the moment. Honestly, I just thought it was a bikini cut. Like, <laughs> that kind of underwear exists. <laughs> like, we're not all wearing granny panties all the time. Sorry to disappoint. <laughs> <laughs> my uh, god i can't stand people <laughs> so in a 1984 interview with films and filming magazine um security weaver talked about this she kind of was over it good um she said as for my strip people have said ah how could you demean yourself by doing a strip tease and i say are you kidding 
After five days of blood and guts and fear and sweat and urine, do you think Ripley wouldn't take off her clothes? And like, that's the final word on it. The queen has spoken. Like, it make, yeah. it's obvious. She was filthy. She was filthy. <laughs> Co- use your common sense, people. Use your common sense. And you know what? You're the problem. Maybe you should get your mind out of the gutter. Oh, This my- is the real problem. Maybe you should teach yourself to respect women, not only by how they present themselves in the street, but by how you think of them. How you think of them is just as important as what you think what they put on their body says about them. Sorry, I'm very passionate about this. (laughs) What she said. (laughs) Sorry. Church church trauma. (laughs) I do. When I saw this scene, I was like, we're having another Space Jam 2 moment. Um, yeah let's yeah <laughs> we're diving into it <laughs> um man i feel like i include the quote where she didn't say where she didn't curse i'm like dang i wish i got that one <laughs> but <laughs> the gritty weaver is pretty over it <laughs> i would be too uh this leads to one of my favorite scenes where she's like casually going about the ship and we quickly realize that these this incredible wallpaper is not actually wallpaper. It's actually the Xenomorph who's trying to take a nap. <laughs> I, that was the one that truly scared me. Yeah. That Cause one. I was like, Oh, this is the end of the movie. Okay, cool. She's the cats in a sleep is in a pod in their cryo sleep. Fantastic. The cat survived. She's getting into cryo sleep. Cool. And then it popped out and I freaked out. That part still makes me jump every single time because you know me. I always have my volume at like 100 Mm -hmm. because, yeah. (laughs) So every single time the scene, it makes me scream because it shakes my entire house. Yes. And then (laughs) I love how she like backs up into the closet, puts on the nice shiny unused spacesuit and becomes her own white knight in that moment. It was so cool. Yes. It's so iconic. And I love that she found like one that's clearly been never used before because yeah. we saw the ones from beginning of the film. Those were dirty, dirty. This one's brand new. And she is like that night that you mentioned. That's such a cool note. She's just she's ready to just end this right now. She's like, all right, you've messed with me and my cat for way too long. She's like, I'm done. I want to go home. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of, did you see the part when she was running to the skate pod and she like ran into the wall and she hit the cat's cage into the wall and dropped the I cage. Missed that. <laughs> that would be me. That would be me. And then she like picks it up again and like hits the wall again. I'm like, there's a cat in there, Ripley. Slow down. <laughs> um, but yeah, I love the space suit armor. I mean, it really becomes armor, even though it's just supposed to be a space suit. And she does what she has to do and she kicks the xenomorph out into space. And we just... And saves her cat, which is the most important part. That is the most important part. We just get to see the cat. <laughs> Saner just enjoying the ship. Just very happy. And that brings us to the end of Alien. I'm so glad you made me watch this, Spencer. That's oh, so fun. I could talk about Alien forever, as you've noticed. <laughs> as I've known the entire time I've known you, yes. <laughs> it's just so fun and yeah the costumes are just so incredible they just really do a lot for the storytelling and it's even more incredible to me that this is only like john malo's second film as a costume designer yeah he just like one day he was like oh my gosh i'm doing a film called star wars that's not going to go anywhere wins an oscar and now he's doing alien it's crazy it's crazy and it's so detailed and the costumes really are kind of beautiful and he puts detail into them one thing i noticed that i loved that we really didn't get to mention was all the lace the lacing in the costumes oh, right. which i loved because it's like it's an unnecessary detail but it's so 70s and it makes the costumes really interesting yeah i've i've even forgot to mention that you're so right there's just so much detail in everything and the fact that like there's patches and stamps and little signs like all, all over these costumes <laughs> There is just so much. And oh, thank you for watching this with me. Oh, thank you. Are you ready for our favorite game? You know I am. Hit it, Daniel. The one costume to rule them all. My this one was kind of hard for me because I there's only so many costumes and I love all of them. So it's like every costume is my one costume to rule them all. 
So I just decided to settle with Ellen Ripley's, you know, casual uniform she's wearing Love around it. the ship. You know, it's just very like, it just really set her up to be this lead character that no one really expected because she kind of like flew under the radar at first, you know, 79. No one's expecting this new girl from, you know, off Broadway plays become this incredible lead actress. And I just feel like the costume really set her up in this really kind of bland, non-binary uniform. And to me, it's just like such a staple in film and costume design and horror and sci-fi. And it's just, Ellen Ripley is and remains the moment. <laughs> I I agree. She really is. I love that one as well. Um, my one costume to rule them all is her underwear and t-shirt moment. Because she... <laughs> Is about she has saved herself and her cat and she is ready to relax, but then is caught off guard, but still saves the day. Perfect. Perfect. Iconic. The haters can go be miserable in a corner. <laughs> I hope the haters get some <laughs> face huggers <laughs> on their head <laughs> with some <laughs> aliens implanted in them. Yeah, that's such a good costume. It's just I can't believe that's controversial, but um, uh, yeah, I'm I, annoyed. <laughs> I love it. It's such a good one. <laughs> and this has been a great episode, Elizabeth. It has. It has. I cannot wait for next week, though. Spencer, what are we watching? Well, to continue our space month, we're diving into another one of mine and Elizabeth's favorite space films, Guardians of the Galaxy, the first one. Yes, I'm so excited. This is one of my favorite Marvel movies because of a certain Gamora. <laughs> Love her. I just can't wait. I'm so excited. Thank you all so much for listening. Don't forget to support us on Patreon. If you haven't already, you could listen to our Lord of the Rings, the Art of Costume Blogcast After Dark moment where we talk about Fellowship of the Ring and drink margaritas. And don't forget our podcast store as well and get yourself a Art of Costume Blogcast sweatshirt and t-shirt. Yes, please. But if you can't support us financially, that is fine. That is understandable. If you liked what you heard and have the time to give us a little five-star text review, that would be so wonderful and equally as supportive. Also, if you know some, some other costume fans, give us a suggestion as a suggestion to them. Thank you so much. <laughs> Have a wonderful week. <laughs> Stay away from dark alleyways. And if your friend shows up to your house after they just were exposed to an alien egg, don't let them inside. Yeah. And you know what? Don't don't play with eggs in the wild. You know, leave the animals alone. That's a good rule, Elizabeth. Do not play with alien eggs yeah. or any kind of egg. You never know what's going to come out. <laughs> 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 Your everyone. random fact for the day. <laughs> <laughs>《The Art of Costume Blogcast is hosted and produced by Elizabeth Joy Glass and Spencer Williams. Our audio engineering and editing is done by Dan White. Follow us on Instagram at The Art of Costume Pod or visit theartofcostumeblogcast.com for all blogcast updates. If you want to support the show, go to theartofcostume.com slash podstore. Or you can head over to patreon.com slash theartofcostume for some bonus content. For more costume reviews, deep dives, and interviews, head over to theartofcostume.com, a blog dedicated to highlighting the best in costume design. I am recording. I am recording. Three, two, one, snap. It's hard for me to snap with my pop filter. Right? Because I have to turn my like arm like this.